Hi, welcome everyone to the very first session of the day. My name is Andrea Weitich. I am from Weta Digital. And today we have a whole day of material and the session now, the BXDF session has a common theme. It will deal with um, acquisition of real world data. And I would encourage everyone to post the questions in the rocket chat as in the last days, you can post them at any time you want and we will discuss them at the end of every talk. So the first talk will be by James Biren and Peter Pierce. And James will present uh, the talk now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation, an adaptive BRDF fitting metric. Given a reference material, BRDF fitting is the problem of choosing the parameters for a BRDF model such that the model best recreates the appearance of that measured material. Let's look at an example. Here is the nickel material from the Merle database rendered on a sphere under the Uffizi Gallery light probe. Nickel is a challenging material to model. Let's look at a simple least squares fit of the Cook-Torrance model to the measured reflectance of nickel. For materials that are challenging to model, least squares fitting does not usually give a visually accurate result. The diffuse component here is clearly much too strong. Can the old Cook-Torrance model do any better? Lowe et al. introduced a logarithmic fitting metric based on the observation that the specular highlight tends to dominate the least squared approach because it is orders of magnitude larger than the reflectance away from the specular highlight directions. This led to a major improvement in BRDF fits for old and new models alike. The question is, can we do better? We have developed a new fitting metric that can achieve even more perceptually accurate fits than the logarithmic metric. Here we see our fit of nickel with the Cook-Torrance model. The diffuse color, best seen in the top of the sphere above the bright specular highlight, is clearly far more accurate. Just how much of a difference can BRDF fitting make? This is tungsten carbide, also from the Merle database. It is very challenging to model. Let's look at three BRDF models, each fit to this material. None of these models are perfectly matching the reference, but clearly some are doing better than others. One is Cook Torrance, one is GGX, and one is Alshu Pakanowski. Can you guess which model is which? Model A is the Alshu Pakanowski model. Presented at SIGGRAPH in 2017, this model has 11 parameters and models multiple scales of microgeometry. Now let's look at model B. Model B is the GGX microfacet model. Presented at EGSR in 2007, GGX has eight parameters and has been used in numerous follow-up works as well as industry. But it doesn't look like the best match here. Model C is Cook-Torrance. Hardly state-of-the-art today, the Cook-Torrance model was presented in 1982, back when you could title your paper, A Reflectance Model for Computer Graphics. Clearly, this is not the order anyone was expecting. The Elshu Pakanowski model is much more expressive than Cook-Torrance, and the GGX model uses a distribution which is widely acknowledged as an improvement over the Beckman distribution used by Cook-Torrance. So what is going on here? As you have probably guessed, this has to do with the fitting methods used. The Alshu and Pekanowski model here is using the fit they provided in their supplemental material. For many materials, it's not a bad fit, but for more complex materials, there is some room for improvement. For the GGX model, we used a state-of-the-art logarithmic fitting strategy. It gave a fit which, compared with prior work, would probably have been considered good. For the Cook-Torrance model, we used our own adaptive fitting strategy. The takeaway, BRDF fitting matters. In fact, it can matter just as much as what model you use and sometimes even more. This begs the question, can we do better with these more advanced models? We most certainly can. Here we see the GGX model with our adaptive fitting strategy. It is similar to the Cook-Torrance fit, but perceptual metrics give GGX a slight edge here. And how about Olshu Pekanowski? Our strategy gives this fit. Clearly an improvement over the published fit and a closer match to the reference. Unlike the eight parameter models, it can try to recreate the variation in color at different angles. I hope that this little exercise has convinced you that BRDF fitting is worth paying attention to just as you carefully choose what model to use. Let's take a closer look at the problem. Here we have nickel, the material we used in our first example. In the top left is a rendering of the measured material. This graph shows a slice of the BRDF times foreshortening for normal incidence plotted according to outgoing angle. As we expect, the highest reflectance is the backscattering at zero degrees. 
While this is only one small slice of the BRDF, it can still be informative. Next, we show a least squares fit of the reflectance data. You can see the reflectance plotted in blue on the graph and a rendering of the fit shown in the bottom left. This is clearly not a very good fit for this slice of the BRDF. The problem is that for each slice, the specular highlight tends to dominate the error. Lowe et al. introduced a logarithmic compression of the reflectance times for shortening that can greatly improve the visual quality of fits. The logarithmic fit is shown in green on the graph. It is clearly a better fit to the reference, shown in red. However, the logarithmic compression is not necessarily the best compression. While it usually outperforms no compression at all, a better metric may exist. We propose to use a different compression function, which raises the BRDF times for shortening to the power of 1 over gamma. This gives us a metric whose behavior, specifically the strength of the compression, depends on a free parameter gamma. Let's look at the impact of gamma on renderings, as well as on the BRDF plot. For a gamma value of 3, the compression is extremely strong. While the rendering looks plausible, it is a bit blurry, so let's see what happens if we start to decrease gamma. Gamma 2.9 is slightly weaker, but the change is negligible on both the rendering and the plot. Here's 2.8, 2.7, 2.6, 2.5. We can now see the plot changing by a bit more than before. 2.4, 2.3. Here's gamma 2.2. Incidentally, also the gamma correction used for tone mapping these images. Although unlike gamma correction for images, for BRDF fitting, we do not have a cutoff at 1. Here's gamma 2.1. Gamma 2.0. Now we're getting pretty close to the logarithmic fit in terms of the BRDF plot for the specular highlight. Let's keep going. 1.9. At 1.8, the specular peak is now higher than it was with the log, but still below the reference for 0 degrees. 1.7. 1.6. At 1.5, we are overshooting the specular intensity for this slice of the BRDF, though if we plotted others, we might still be too low. 1.4. 1.3, we can see that we are getting closer and closer to the least squares fit. 1.2, 1.1, and here is gamma equal to 1, which is identical to the least squares fit. We have a lot of different curves on this graph, and we can see that which gamma we choose determines the appearance of the fit for better or worse. Let's look at the impact of gamma more generally. Here is a selection of fits for nickel for various gammas. Lower gammas to the left and higher gammas to the right. Lowering the gamma tends to sharpen the specular highlights while the overall color and diffuse intensity becomes less and less accurate. By contrast, raising gamma tends to raise the roughness, blurring the specular highlight. However, the overall color and intensity of pixels away from the bright specular highlights become more and more accurate. Given this range of potential fits, which do we choose and how? For nickel, gamma 1.9 gives the most similar rendering. The specular highlight shape is very similar to the logarithmic fit in this case, but there is a big difference in the accuracy of the diffuse reflectance. If we average the BRDF times for shortening for the remaining 65 degrees not plotted on this graph, we find that the selected fit is orders of magnitude more accurate, and that is clearly visible in the renderings. Speaking of renderings, that brings us to the question of how we choose the best fit. We use a two-stage algorithm for BRDF fitting. In the first stage, we begin with the BRDF measurements of a material. Then we use our metric with a range of gamma values to generate a set of candidate fits. Then we use a render to generate images corresponding to those fits by rendering each one in a target scene. We then compare each of those images with a rendering of the measured material in the same scene using a perceptual metric. This gives us perceptual errors for each candidate fit. We find the candidate fit with the lowest perceptual error and choose those fitted parameters. We call our method adaptive because as opposed to using a fixed cost function to optimize the BRDF parameters the same way for every material, we use the free parameter in our metric to adapt it to the material being fitted. Let's look at some more results. We've looked at a lot of metals thus far, now we will look at a plastic. This is green acrylic shown under two different lighting conditions. Here is the least squares fit with the Cook Torrance model. It is not a very good visual match, especially considering the color of the highlights. Using a logarithmic metric, the results are better. However, 
it all looks a little washed out. The highlights in particular are much too weak. Our adaptive metric produces a much more accurate fit. Here is red metallic paint. The Cook Torrance model struggles with this material, but our adaptive fit, again, is closer. Let's move on to something really challenging. Color Changing Paint 1 from the Merle database has an appearance that the Cook Torrance model simply cannot recreate. Here, the image-aware nature of our adaptive metric is on full display. While Cook Torrance cannot model the color changing nature of the material, our adaptive metric can give a wide range of candidates for our perceptual metric to choose from, and it chooses one that is clearly a better visual match than least squares or the logarithmic fit. Our adaptive two-stage fitting technique uses rendering to choose the best fit. You might ask, rendering of what? What specific scene do you use and why? Let's start with lighting. The choice of lighting for our selection scene is important because we want to select fits that generalize well to other lighting conditions. We use the Eucalyptus Grove Light Probe, which Fleming et al. recommended for judging material appearance under natural lighting. Here is our selected fit under that lighting. The question is, does the fit look good under other lighting conditions? We evaluated our fits under four other light probes, including Grace Cathedral. Note that we are using the same BRDF parameters obtained from the adaptive fit under the Eucalyptus Grove lighting. We also used Uffizi Gallery, St. Peter's Basilica, and Beach. We found that our fits do generalize well. Using our chosen selection scene, we compared our fit to the least squares and logarithmic fit for all 100 Merle materials. The number of materials for which each metric gave the best fit, as chosen by our perceptual metric, is shown below each lighting. From this, we conclude that our method does not overfit to the selection lighting. Now let us consider the question of shape. We tested four shapes for potential selection scenes. The sphere, the blob from Van Gorp et al., the Havren et al. shape under point lighting, as described in their paper, and for completeness, their shape under natural lighting. To evaluate these shapes, we used seven other rotations of the blob, all under the same lighting. We concluded that the blob and sphere perform similarly. The Havren et al. shape under natural lighting consistently performed a bit worse. We conjecture it is because grazing angles are hidden. The Havren et al. scene with point lighting did not perform well at all. We agree with prior work showing that natural lighting is important for perceptually matching material appearance. Further, we found that shape is far less important than natural lighting. We chose to use the sphere instead of the blob because it is easier to render, it is invariant to rotation, and it will be easier to replicate in future work. With our test scene nailed down, let's look at the question of optimal gamma. Is there one gamma best for all materials? Is it easy to predict the best gamma for a given material? Except for at gamma 3, the optimal gammas seem fairly evenly distributed in our 1 to 3 range. Gamma 3 was our cutoff. It is likely that many materials at 3 would have higher optimal gammas if we extended our range. However, most of those materials at 3 are very diffuse, and the visual impact of going beyond 3 is so negligible that we felt it was not necessary to expand our range. Besides extremely diffuse materials being at or near 3, it is very hard to find patterns in the optimal gamma by material type. Another question you might ask regarding our two-stage algorithm might be whether the results make it worth doing. For example, can we skip the two-stage process and just optimize an image space directly? Here we have the cumulative perceptual errors over our four evaluation light probes for each of the three fitting metrics we have considered. Now, let's look at the error if we use fits obtained by optimizing the BRDF parameters using inverse rendering on our selection scene. We find that due to overfitting to the lighting, the fits have higher error on average for other lighting conditions than our adaptive fitting metric. Perceptual image metrics clearly show that our two-stage adaptive fitting technique is an improvement over prior fitting metrics. But do humans agree? To determine this, we performed a user study. In total, we collected 10,000 user judgments. 
users were shown a form showing three renderings of the blob shape. In the center was the reference image. They were asked to choose between two possible fits, comparing log versus our adaptive technique randomly positioned left or right. The shape is randomly rotated and the lighting is a fizzy gallery because it is color neutral, making it easier to see color differences. They were asked which option best matches the material appearance of the reference visualization. In this example, which would you have voted for? For this material, the adaptive metric won 17 votes to 8. Let's take a look at another material. This is nylon. It is not clear at first which is better, but looking closely, we observe the left option has specular highlights, while the right option barely has any. Which would you have voted for? Users chose the adaptive fit by a solid 18 to 7 margin. Over a 50 material test set, users preferred our Cook Torrance fit over the logarithmic Cook Torrance fit 78% of the time. Here we can see the breakdown by material class. The only category where the logarithmic approach was competitive was for phenolics. A simple majority over 25 votes is not necessarily indicative of a major preference by users. To separate the clear winners from those materials for which the voting was close, we also look at cases where there was a two-thirds supermajority of votes for one method or the other. Here we can see the results for materials in our test set for which users returned a decision by a ratio of at least two to one. We can see here that metals are the material for which our method provides the most benefit, while for phenolics, both adaptive and logarithmic strategies work similarly well. In conclusion, we introduced a novel BRDF fitting metric and an adaptive two-stage approach to BRDF fitting. We showed how using our fitting strategy can provide visual quality improvements on par with improved models. We use a metric with a free parameter gamma. For lower gammas, it gives sharper highlights, while for higher gammas, the overall color and diffuse intensity improve. We use a perceptual image metric to choose the best gamma suited for fitting a BRDF model to a given material. I hope you have found our presentation informative and that our work will inspire further improvements to BRDF fitting methods. There is a much more thorough analysis of all the factors we have considered today in our paper. Additionally, you can find everything we did here and more for the GGX model in addition to Cook Torrance. All of the results shown today use the CSSIM perceptual image metric. But in our paper, we perform all of our analysis with both CSSIM and a newer machine learning based metric called LPIPS. Finally, you will find a much more detailed description and analysis of our user study. Thank you all for watching. We are happy to answer any of your questions. No. Thank you, James, very much for this very interesting talk and the very interesting paper. Again, I would encourage everyone to post questions into the rocket chat. And while this happens, uh, I don't know, we do have the first questions already. Oh my God. So we have the first question. How does it compare with previous work on image-based uh, BRDF fitting using a perceptually based image similarity metric? And then for so, instance, okay, sorry, go. Oh, so um, we compared to directly optimizing CSSIM, which is the first of the two metrics we used in our paper for perceptual image comparison. And the second we used, we struggled to get working because the air landscape was so, was so bumpy. So for directly optimizing CSSIM, we found that while direct optimization does give you a better result in the lighting you're optimizing for, it tends to give higher errors on other light probes, which we found outweighed those advantages. Um, we didn't look too much at moving between analytic BRDFs, for which, as, as the question notes, there's been some work in, in visual-based moving between parameters. I'm not familiar with whether there's work on that um, to data from measured materials. I don't think there is. So I suspect the results will be similar to what we found, which is better under that lighting, but doesn't generalize quite as well. 
Then we have another one from Abhijit. Uh, is the gamma parameter doing similar things to the alpha parameter found in the work of Gen BRDF? So that's probably a question better for Peter. I'm not familiar with what exactly the alpha parameter in that work was because alpha is usually the roughness for BRDFs. And so, well, there is a, a definite relationship between the gamma and its effect on the roughness parameter. It's, I don't think, the same as the sort of thing that they were doing in that paper. Mm -hmm. And then we have one from Elian. Perceptual image differences depend on various parameters like color spaces, image post-processing as well as display characteristics. Have you investigated these? Do you need a different fit for different viewing conditions? Um, so first we tried a couple different color spaces, including LAB and found that at least in our tests, color space had minimal impact in terms of fitting in the other color space, but everything we were doing was just being displayed and the errors computed, like the final errors in uh, RGB. And so it's possible that if you had a way to display a broader color space, you'd need to fit there. Um, in terms of other image processing and display characteristics, we tested the impact of the gamma used for display and found that while for extreme differences, like if you were to show the images as linear images, you would have some impact on the gamma, it was nowhere close to one to one. So an extreme difference in the display would only lead to a relatively small difference in the optimal gamma for fitting. And uh, another one, is it better to use simpler models such as is uh, Coctorans and your adaptive fit over the more recent sophisticated models. So I guess um, this question is about parameter numbers. Yeah. Um, so everything we tested, um, so everything in the paper is eight parameters. We um, did some work with the low at all models, although we, we didn't end up including them for space. It was already 16 pages on BRDF fitting. But um, we found that at least for models with a relatively low number of parameters, better models tended to get better fits. And so no, even though in our example, we show Cook Torrance outperforming prior fits with other models, generally the better models do give perceptually better fits if you use our method. <laughs> Very important. Uh, and then another one from Word Code. Uh, in which kind of materials uh, does the adaptive metric work the best? So glossy, diffuse, or specular, anything like this? So um, for diffuse materials, it tends not to matter much because all the models that we used have a diffuse component that models it well. And so it really doesn't make much a difference. For, for glossy materials, especially plastics, we tended to get a bit better intensity on the specular highlights, but the differences weren't that extreme. It was really for the metals and especially the hazier metals and some like steel in the Merle database that maybe aren't 100% accurately measured because of, of, the, of the capture setup where um, older fits would maybe overfit to artifacts. And so we find that it's for the metals that we get the biggest improvement. Although because of the adaptive nature and the fact that it gets to see the images we didn't have many cases where our fit was visually worse than prior work. It's just, it took longer to get to. And then for some materials that are more challenging to model, we found the bigger visual differences. And uh, uh, Vlastimil is uh, asking, have you tested the method and anisotropic measured BADF data? Uh, we have not. Yeah. We, we, we looked into it uh, briefly, but we found that for the interesting anisotropic materials, so meaning ones where the anisotropy is noticeable enough that you'd be interested in the effects, the models we were working with weren't actually able to replicate it well enough to to really, like it, the perceptual metrics would say it was better, but you were still looking at it like, well, that's still not a good fit. So I think that the models there really need to get a little further along, or at least we need to find more advanced ones to use if you're going to see it in a way that makes it look like it's all that useful. But your metric would still work with um, anisotropic? So I think so. I think the biggest thing would be um, you'd have to change the sampling pattern because we don't sample both um, in and out around the normal. And so uh, because for isotropic materials, it doesn't matter. But you'd have to change the sampling pattern in order to get the effects of anisotropy to be considered. And I think we have the last time for the last question uh, uh, from Stephen Hill. Did you happen to try any other perceptual metrics such as CIE Delta E 2000? Um, we didn't try that one. We did try HDR VDP2, which um, didn't work well because it doesn't consider color. It only considers intensity. Um, 
we, but we did not try the um, any of the CIE versions of the metrics. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting talk and Thank great you. presentation. Uh, for the sake of keeping in the time frame, I would now suggest we move on to the next paper. The authors will stay active in the chat if there are any further questions. And again, just uh, type in whatever you want to know. And we will move on to the next paper now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this talk. I'm Ye Zhao from Shandong University. And today, I have the pleasure to present our paper entitled Joint SVBRDF Recovery and Synthesis from a Single Image Using an Unsupervised Generative Adversarial Network. This is a joint work with Bebe, Yan Ning, Zheng, Lu, and Nicholas. To produce realistic images, we need to model realistic surface appearance. Artists usually use specialized tools, such as Substance Designer, to create high-resolution texture and normal maps. It is a manual and complex process to achieve realistic results. Our goal is to recreate high-resolution SVBRDF maps from real-world materials automatically without using extensive acquisition system. Existing algorithms can produce high-quality SVBRDFs with single or few input images using supervised deep learning. Atala et al. models the SVBRDF maps from a single flash image of a stationary textured material. They avoid the need for explicit pixel-to-pixel -pixel correspondences by relying on a CNN-based texture descriptor for assessing the differences between the rendered image and flash image. Li et al. use an encoder-decoder architecture network to directly learn material properties. They train separate networks for different types of materials, such as wood and plastic. Li Shan et al. enriched the encoder-decoder architecture with a secondary network that extracts global features. They also introduced an in-network renderer, which computes derivatives automatically during backpropagation to further enhance the estimated reflectance parameters. We adopt this in-network renderer in our work as well. But these methods can only produce fixed low-resolution SVBRDF maps because of the fully connected layers in their network design. A more recent work estimates the SVBRDFs of a planar exemplar from an arbitrary number of input images. With more input images, the SVBRDF maps get more precise. But their method relies on a plausible starting point of optimizing. To get larger maps, we may use some texture synthesis methods. But separate texture synthesis leads to inconsistency between the generated SVBRDF maps. We tackle the two problems of SVBRDF reconstruction and synthesize simultaneously. Given a single captured image taken by phone, we aim to recover and also synthesize the SVBRDF maps with higher resolution. First, we follow the assumption and the setup proposed by previous works to get an image. As shown in the left figure, the light source is very close to the camera. So at each individual pixel, the lighting and viewing directions can be considered identical. The image is taken off a flat, textured surface with repetitive features, so we can utilize the texels to synthesize larger texture. Our key insight is to employ again to produce re-rendered images similar to the input images. From the captured image, we first randomly chose a candidate tile X with a size of 2n times 2n and crop a tile XC 
with a size of n times n from the center of x and feed it into the generator. The generator consists of an encoder and two decoders. We call it two-stream generator. The two-stream generator produces SVBRDF maps with higher resolution than the image type XC. We use an on-train encoder in our network. Figure on the right visualizes several layers of latent vectors output by the encoder and shows the textures are preserved well. Please refer to our paper for the network architecture details. Our two-stream generator has two decoders, one for normal and roughness, and the other for diffuse and specular. The key idea behind is to force the network to optimize maps with balance, otherwise the diffuse map tends to be overestimated. The discriminator distinguishes between the real data, the cropped image tile X, and the fake data, the rendered image Y. We also propose a guest diffuse map and use it as rough ground truth for the diffuse map. As our method is unsupervised and we do not have the ground truth maps. We normalize the input image removing lighting and highlights. Please refer to our paper for more details about the computation of our gas diffuse map. Based on the gas diffuse map, we propose a joint loss function, a weighted adversarial loss and a L1 loss between generated diffuse map and the gas diffuse map. We also try rendering loss between a re-render image Y and an image tile X, but the results are not satisfying. When there are highlights on the input image, the diffuse map produced by a network using rendering loss is overestimated. As shown in the right figure, the highlights appear in the diffuse map. Next, we will show some results of our method. We use images from the freely available flash image dataset from Atala et al. to test our method. Here we show the generated SVBRDF maps of the captured image using our method. The size of the input image is 1632 times 1224, and the size of the generated SVBRDF maps is 3264 times 2448. Our model can expand an image to twice of its input size. By repeating the expansion, we can synthesize higher resolutions. We show an example. The input size is 512 times 512. The first time we run the model, we get 1024 times 1024 SVBRDF maps, and we use them to render a 1024 times 1024 image. The model is then performed again using this 1024 x 1024 image as input and produces 2048 x 2048 SVBRDFs. We do the same as before and get a 2048 x 2048 runner image and send it to the model and get 1496 x 1496 SVBRDF maps. By repeating the expansion, we can synthesize higher resolutions. With a 24G Titan X GPU, we can generate 4K resolution at most. Here we show more high resolution SVBRDF maps and rendered images. This is a wood board material. And this is a fabric material. As expected, the SVBRDFs maintain consistent structure across an entire image and rich in details. We also show a zoom-in view of SVBRDF maps for more real-world captured materials.
To further validate our method, we used our sensor side maps to render a 3D scene. In this scene, maps for the chair, the bucket, the desk, the sofa, and the pillows are recovered from captured images. The white brick wall and the wood floor are recovered from rendered images. The scene is rendered with Arnold Renderer. Our generated high-resolution maps produce a seamless appearance. We compare our method with previous works. In this figure, our network is trained using a rendered 1024 x 1024 image with known viewing and lighting directions. For Go et al., we use the reference maps to render 20 images as inputs and discern et al.'s outputs as initialization. The results with the lowest MSE are labeled using a red block. For the recovered SBBRDFs, our method generates better diffuse and specular map, while the roughness map is less accurate. Comparing the novel view rendered result, although Go et al. has the lowest error, our result is more similar to the reference visually. Here we compare the outputs with different loss functions of our network. In the second rule, our SVBRDF maps using our joint loss function. The third rule using a joint loss function with rendering loss and adversarial loss. And the last rule using adversarial loss only. In the last two rows, we observe that the uneven light is picked in the maps, and rendered image under a different normal view don't change. In contrast, the network trained using our design loss function produces more correct maps. In this figure, we compare the generated SVBRDFs and we rendered results of our on-trained encoder and the trained encoder. Both the maps and the rendered results are close to the references. The network with a trained encoder has more parameters, thus it has stronger fitting capabilities. The network with an on-trained encoder can produce results that are not much different from the previous approach, and the MSE of the diffuse map and the roughness map are even lower. Besides, our on-trained encoder saves training time. However, our method has several limitations. Our method relies on cropping a lot of small tiles from the input image to train the model. The model cannot be trained successfully when the input image does not have repetitive features. In this case, our method fails to synthesize and only increases the resolution. Besides, each input for our method requires individual training, which costs about 3 hours. In conclusion, we have presented an unsupervised generative adversarial network for simultaneous recovery and synthesis of SVBRDF maps from a single image without large training dataset. We proposed a two-stream generator and a novel joint loss function. From a low-resolution input image, our method can generate high-resolution SVBRDF maps. In future work, we want to introduce existing knowledge about the material. For example, leather is more specular, and fabric is more diffuse. Thank you for your attention. The code is available under this link. Thank you very much uh, for the talk and the paper. Yizi and uh, Bibi are here today to discuss the paper. As always, uh, questions go into the rocket chat. And we have one from Valentin uh, who asks, maybe I missed it, but if you use Itala 16 method for diffuse map guessing, do you inherit the stationary material requirements? 
Uh, yes, we have the same requirements as Atala, and the texture has to be stationary. Um, okay, I have actually another question. So I noticed that you split, you have two different decoders, one for diffuse specular and the other one for normal maps and roughness. Is it a coincidence that the data you split it up in a nonlinear and linear data? Mm. Um, the reason we split we split the four maps to two groups is uh, at the beginning we uh, want to just want to split the diffuse and the other three maps, and uh, during our training we find that uh, decoders with uh, 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 almost the same channels can reduce the training time and thus reduce the parameters. So we just split the four maps to two groups uh, and split, uh, especially split, split the diffuse map and the normal map. And for the other two, we just, uh, we don't care whether it is uh, together with the diffuse map or the normal map. Okay, thank you. Um, Nick is asking regarding limitations and failure cases, the global structure example still appears to produce plausible SVB IDF values. The failure was only on the synthesis side. Are there certain cases or types of material where the generated SVB IDF parameters are not plausible? Um. Uh, I think our method, our method can't handle the input image with uh, large saturated highlights because it will cause implausible gas diffuse map. And uh, then there's a, a follow up to the, the splitting. Uh, if did you try to put specular and roughness in the same group as uh, they are quite related? So instead of normal map roughness, that you would put uh, specular and roughness together. Uh, we haven't tried it, but it's a good point. Well, thank you for a follow up paper, maybe. Um, and then we have another one from Abhijit. Um, what is the advantage of the method over the constrained texture synthesis approach? Besides the generation speed. Uh, I think I'm going to answer this question. Uh, so our advantage is we can keep the consistency over different maps. And if we using if we use uh, the other texture synthesis approaches and we will produce the maps differently. That means uh, the, the, there is some uh, inconsistency uh, along the maps. Uh, uh, the, the, the maps are misaligned. I think that is answering that. Otherwise, we just get a follow up in the, in the chat. Uh, and then I would have actually one more questions because you mentioned in the paper that with a single input image, the problem is under constraint and several maps would contribute to the observed features. Did you actually experiment with that? Did you try to use several maps and, would, and how far would that increase the results? I'm sorry, I, I didn't follow you. Ah, sorry, I will repeat. So in the paper, you said that uh, with a single input image that the problem is under constraint and that you could use more maps to get better, uh, better features, better results. So did you do any, any results, uh, any experiments with that? Um, you mean we use more input yeah. images as um, yeah. oh, we haven't tried it. Okay. Mm. But I think um, uh, taking photos, uh, taking more, more photos of the uh, uh, same 
uh, appearance is um, it's difficult for the network uh, because um, it's hard to control the uh, position you hold your smartphone and the light is also hard to control. So um, I think the network might have problems when facing these uh, input images. Well, thank you very much. If there are no further questions, I would say we move on to the last paper of the session, which uh, is uh, authored by uh, Iliana Gitlina, Giuseppe Claudio Guarniera, Dajit Zing Dillon, Jan Hansen, Alexandre Zlatas, Dinesh Pai, and Abhijit Ghosh. And Julia will present take the paper now. Hello, my name is Julia Gitlina. I'm presenting the work on practical measurement and reconstruction of spectral skin reflectance that we conducted at Imperial College London in collaboration with my co-authors. Accurate modeling and rendering of human skin has always been a challenging goal in computer graphics. For photorealistic rendering, we want the appearance of a rendered person to match that of a real subject as close as possible. On top of that, we want to be able to realistically simulate skin appearance of a real person in different lighting conditions. In this work, we want to drive the facial rendering using biophysical skin parameters, which would then drive spectral BSS RDF rendering to reproduce photorealistic appearance of human skin under any spectral lighting condition without actually having to acquire skin measurements in all those conditions. Having said that, in our work, we propose the following high-level contributions. Firstly, we propose a novel practical approach for measuring spectral skin reflectance which is suitable for facial capture. Through this measurement, we then estimate skin parameters for photorealistic spectral reproduction and rendering of facial appearance. Next, we also demonstrate how to adapt and augment parameters obtained from a medical skin measurement device for realistic skin appearance reproduction and rendering. Additionally, we demonstrate how cascaded neural networks can be used for accelerated and improved skin parameter estimation provided our measurements. There have previously been works in computer graphics on detailed biophysical modeling of skin. While having high accuracy in biophysical simulations of skin appearance, such models are quite complex for driving them from measurements. Hence, in our work, we focus on a simpler diffusion-based spectral model of skin in order to estimate parameters from measurements. The first detailed spectral skin measurement was performed by Donner et al, but their approach was only practical for patches of skin and not for the full facial measurement. Closest to our approach is the work by Jimenez et al, who proposed a reduced spectral skin model and employed measurement procedure to estimate two primary skin parameters, which they employed to render skin appearance using template, geometry, and texture. In contrast, in our work, we want to drive a rendering with both acquired geometry and skin parameters that reconstruct the true facial appearance. In our work, we employ a simplified model, which, however, at the same time has sufficient complexity to match the observed spatial variation in skin. Thus, we used the model of Jimenez et al, but varying all four parameters instead of just two. The model includes two primary chromophores contained in skin, such as melanin and dermal hemoglobin. The image on the right shows the 2D slices of the full spectral 4D skin coloration model. In each slice, horizontal axis represents the change in melanin, while vertical axis shows the change in dermal hemoglobin. Unlike Jimenez's model, we also empirically found that we need to vary two more parameters, which are melanin blend type fraction and epidermal hemoglobin fraction for more accurate appearance reproduction. This slide shows comparison of appearance reconstructions of 2D versus 4D model. We determined that the additional melanin blend type fraction parameter is important for reproducing facial hair and skin color around eye sockets. We also found that it is necessary to vary fraction of epidermal hemoglobin to match the redness in lips and area around the cheeks. We now present our first primary contribution. Here we describe our method for practical spectral acquisition of human faces for measuring skin reflectance. 
Our setup employs a multispectral LED sphere equipped with six different LED types. Namely, it contains narrow band red, green and blue and broad band warm neutral and cold white LEDs. We also measured and recorded spectral power distributions of each illuminant using spectrometer to analyze response of each LED for the visible light in the range between 400 to 700 nanometers. We also employed nine color DSLR cameras for multi-view acquisition of the subject and cross-polarized LEDs with respect to the camera for specular cancellation. We designed our acquisition setup considering the practical constraints of standard LED illuminants as well as regular color cameras. We analyzed spectral skin reflectance profiles from Donor et al. under flat illumination spectrum and observed that they have skewed red dominant response. To balance these reflectance profiles, we employed D65 spectrum, which has a blue dominant spectral power distribution. Hence, when convolved together, the resulting skin reflectance under D65 illumination will flatten, highlighting the contrast in skin color, which is ideal for our measurements. However, D65 illumination is not directly possible with individual LEDs contained in our LED sphere. Instead, we had to create a D65 metamer through weighted combination of the six available LEDs in our setup to approximate ideal D65 spectrum. Illuminating color chart under D65 metamer will result in the colors of each patch captured by the camera closely matching the colors of the color chart patches when recorded by ideal D65 illumination, even though these two illuminants have different spectral power distributions. Thus, to produce D65 metamer spectrum, we ran an optimization procedure that minimizes the difference in color between the patches of measured color chart and the reference color chart in sRGB color space, which assumes ideal D65 spectrum. The resulting spectral power distribution of D65 metamer is plotted in orange in comparison to the standard D65 spectrum which is plotted in black. Even though the metamer spectra is different from standard D65 spectra, it still produces the same colors on a color chart. We provide more details on computation in our paper. We further combined broadband D65 metamer measurement with the narrow band blue, which is supported by previous research by Priest and Claridge. According to their work, the peak around 485 nanometers gives maximum variability in melanin concentration. The peak response of our narrow band blue illumination falls very close at 480 nanometers, which allows us to directly measure melanin response and hence capture sharper texture with more detailed skin pigmentation. Thus, when jointly employing broadband D65 metamer and narrowband blue measurements, we can estimate sharper descattered parameter maps using our chosen biophysical model. Directly recording skin reflectance response under blue LED unfortunately results in some colors being outside the gamut of most of the shelf color cameras. The chromaticity of the narrowband blue LED falls outside both sRGB and Adobe RGB color spaces. This results in suboptimal and blurry narrowband measurements. In this slide, left image represents direct measurement under blue LED, while the image on the right shows its isolated blue channel. Instead, we propose a novel procedure to overcome gamut limitation of regular color cameras. For that, we first record measurement under uniform broadband illumination, which is shown in image A, and then capture another image under a mix of broadband and narrowband blue LED illumination, which is shown in image B. With these two images, we computationally isolate the narrowband blue response using chromatic adaptation transform to generate synthetic blue image, which is shown in grayscale in image C. We refer the audience to the paper for details of implementation. In this slide, you can see a close-up comparison of isolated blue channels of direct blue measurement against the synthesized blue measurement. While direct blue response lost some spatial details of skin texture, the synthesized blue image records sharper descattered pigmentation, which is correlated with melanin concentration in skin.
Another advantage of our method is that usually such kind of measurement would require the usage of narrowband filters on illumination, while we didn't have to employ that. With the following measurement protocol, we perform joint lookup table search, where one lookup table is simulated under D65 metamer illumination, and the other one under blue channel of synthesized blue illumination. We compute the best matching color values between lookup tables and photographs in CIE LAB space. So in this slide, we are visualizing the four estimated chromophore maps of melanin, melanin blend type, dermal hemoglobin, and epidermal hemoglobin, respectively. And in the bottom row, you can now see comparison of the photographs to the reconstructed images under two different illumination spectra using our method. Here are examples of two more subjects with estimated chromophore maps and reconstructions under different spectra. While the reconstructed appearance is matched closely to the photographs under cooler spectrum, the maps also predict softening and blurring of skin under warmer illumination. Until now, our focus was on skin measurements in a controlled setup that is suitable for facial capture. Now I will talk about our second contribution, which involved adapting and augmenting skin measurements from an off-the-shelf dermatological device for spectral rendering with our method. The device is called Miravex Antares 3D, and it acquires data by illuminating skin patch from different angles under seven different narrow and broad spectral bands. The reflectance data is captured by the camera and is then transformed into skin patch albedo, as well as redness and pigmentation maps. The device also recovers surface geometry using photometric stereo. Given that Antara estimates only the two primary parameters related to melanin and hemoglobin concentration, we need to adapt and augment them with our 4D skin coloration model. In the first step, we adapt these maps based on the reduced 2D model of skin by Jimenez et al. using skin patch albedo provided by Antara. Given our best fit to the 2D model, we then scale Antara's maps for pigmentation and redness to match the mean and variance of our estimated melanin and hemoglobin parameters. We set this scaled pigmentation and redness maps as our final estimates for melanin and hemoglobin concentrations. In the next step, we refit the albedo data to the complete 4D model by searching for the two remaining skin parameters while fixing the adapted primary chromophore concentrations. From that, we also reconstruct the augmented 4D skin patch appearance. To perform all these steps, we need to know spectral power distribution of Antara. Since information on Antara's illumination spectrum is not provided by the device or the vendor, we had to estimate the unknown illumination spectrum for the albedo measurement ourselves. Our paper describes genetic algorithm-based optimization, which estimates the unknown illumination spectrum using a single color chart measurement. We noticed that the recovered spectrum for Antares albedo is an approximation of D65 illumination created with combination of the LEDs on the device. This is conceptually similar to the D65 metamer illumination that we create using our LED sphere, and also provides independent support towards the choice of D65 as the ideal broadband measurement. By implementing all aforementioned steps, we can use this medical device for photorealistic appearance reproduction and rendering. This slide shows some additional examples of skin patch measurements from Antara and their reconstructions using 2D mapping and 4D augmentation. As can be seen, the reconstruction result of remapping and augmentation to complete 4D model is a much closer match to the albedo map than just remapping the data to the reduced 2D model. So far, we described how to estimate the spectral skin parameters using a lookup table search. This process is quite slow and the results can be prone to image noise and quantization due to discrete sampling of values in the lookup table. So moving to our next contribution, we explored a neural prediction approach for estimating spectral skin parameters. We implemented cascaded feed-forward multilayer perceptron architecture where each of the four parameters of our model is estimated by a different MLP. 
In our pipeline, each MLP is trained on synthetic RGB data, which consists of the 4D lookup tables generated by the spectral skin reflectance model. Each MLP shares the input from an RGB albedo image. Parameter estimation proceeds with in-depth order of skin tissue, first estimating melanin and melanin blend type fraction, and then moving deeper into skin to estimate epidermal and dermal hemoglobin. The last MLP in the cascade sequence, called RGB albedo, takes in input all four estimated parameters to predict the final RGB albedo. Our estimated parameters and the reconstructed RGB albedo using neural networks demonstrate comparable results to the ones achieved using lookup table search. Moreover, the advantages of such approach include reduced noise and quantization, as well as significantly accelerated parameter estimation and reflectance reconstruction, which compares as 3.5 seconds against 40 minutes lookup table search for 2K resolution. Our measurements also allow us to perform physiologically based skin edits through scaling the estimated parameter maps. Here we show example of a face and also example of Antara data. It is possible to simulate flushed appearance of skin as well as make it look drained or tanned. The last thing I'm going to talk about is rendering subsurface scattering in skin using estimated spectral parameters. We used PBRT for implementing heterogeneous subsurface scattering in skin given the estimated spatially varying spectral reflectance profiles without the need of a modulation texture. We obtain a facial scan of a subject with multi-view acquisition in the LED sphere. The scan reconstructs face geometry and facial textures projected into UV space under D65 metamera and synthesized blue illumination. From these textures, we then compute four spectral skin parameters in UV space. These maps are then projected onto the face geometry within PBRT. And finally, we can generate the diffuse rendering with our spectral skin coloration model under chosen illumination. We also render the specular reflectance component in PBRT and separately add it to the diffuse-only rendering as a post-process. Here we demonstrate a short video of facial rendering from different view and light directions, as well as various illumination spectra. We also visualize transitions of diffuse-only renderings between different spectra of LEDs available in our LED sphere. Important to note is that this is the appearance that a color camera would see under these LEDs. Another point is that we do not employ any modulation texture for any of these renderings, but instead we use spatially varying diffusion profiles to reconstruct facial appearance. In such way, same estimated skin parameters predict appearance under any other illumination. Our approach also makes it possible for the first time to compare facial photos to spectral BSS RDF renderings. As can be seen, renderings with the estimated parameters correctly predict the change in appearance across the six spectrums, with softening of skin appearance under the warmer spectrums. Moving on to the limitations of the work, we notice that although the 4D spectral skin model can reconstruct appearance of skin and even facial hair, it cannot well reconstruct the appearance of dominant veins or tattoos. This happens because veins and tattoos cannot be modeled with melanin and hemoglobin concentrations. We also currently don't model any fluorescence in skin although our broadband measurements are likely to include some effects of dermal fluorescence. Another point is that for faces there is partial ambient occlusion which is baked into the measurements, which we do not explicitly account for during parameter estimation. 
To summarize our work, we presented a novel practical approach for measuring spectral skin reflectance by using combination of broad and narrowband illumination, which can be achievable with standard LEDs and regular color cameras. We also adapted and augmented physiological measurements from the medical camera Antara 3D for realistic spectral appearance reproduction and rendering. Additionally, we demonstrated a novel neural architecture for much more efficient parameter estimation and spectral reconstruction given facial and skin patch measurements. Our work enables photorealistic reconstruction and rendering of human skin using biophysically based spectral BSS-RDF. We believe that the future work in this direction could investigate practical measurements and modeling of changes in skin parameters due to skin dynamics or physiological factors, which would be of interest in medical diagnostics and skincare industry. We also thank the following subjects for allowing their skin measurements and also the funding agencies for their support. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yulia, for this uh, very extensive and great paper. You have a lot of content in this paper. Um, and we also have a lot of questions for you. And uh, we'll start with uh, questions about the spectra you were using in the acquisition. Uh, Vlastimir is asking uh, the Antera device, why you did not use a spectrometer for visible light range to measure the spectra for used LEDs in time. Can you shed a little bit of light on uh, that? Yeah, so, um, so we have a sp uh, spectrometer that we're using for SPD measurements in our LED setup. And we are back again, and Julia is still here to answer your questions. Please proceed. <laughs> um, do you want to, to finish what you said about the Yeah, maybe I should repeat the answer for the yeah, first just, question. Just quickly, right? the question was yeah, if okay, the, the uh, results can be compared. Uh, so I think typical integration time for the um, spectrometer is uh, about one second, maybe less. But uh, at least that's the case for the one that we use for our light stage setup. Uh, but the problem with Antara is uh, it has many LEDs, which also have different directions. And um, we don't have explicit control of uh, illuminating uh, the skin patch with just one LED. Uh, so it performs measurements with uh, a circular order of uh, illuminating uh, the skin patch. So we cannot explicitly switch on just one and measure its spectral power distribution. And that's the reason why we, we had to um, use the computational methods. Okay. Uh, we have another question about uh, the LEDs and spectra. How does employing individual broadband LED type in your setup compare to skin parameter estimation using simulated D65 uh, illumination? Mm -hmm. So I think I can address a few things here. Uh, so in our LED sphere setup, we have three types of uh, broadband LEDs, which is cold, neutral, and warm white. And um, before this whole idea of creating the 65 metamer, uh, we actually tried to estimate uh, skin parameters using uh, individual broadband LEDs. And uh, from our findings, uh, cold white LED turned out to be the most useful out of three. Uh, it, it highlights uh, contrast in skin color as well as pigmentation, uh, which is good for our measurements. Uh, that happens because the spectral power distribution of the cold white LED has a peak around the blue part of the spectra uh, compared to the other two warmer spectra. And uh, this is good for me measuring melanin response uh, because in the end we want to recover descattered parameter maps uh, to use for rendering subsurface scattering in skin. Uh, this is the answer given we have to choose one out of those three LEDs, but if we had to compare um, cold white LED to uh, D65 metamer, then D65 metamer definitely gives us uh, better chromophore maps. Uh, they have uh, less noise and they have clearer spatial structure. And the reconstruction uh, under D65 metamer also uh, is more accurate. 
but I think I would have to say that uh, if someone wants to do spectral skin measurements uh, for subsurface uh, scattering, for rendering subsurface scattering in skin, and for example, supposing it's not possible to create the 65 metamer within the setup, uh, then it's better to go for uh, the broadband spectrum, for, for the colder broadband spectrum, which has a peak around uh, blue. But of course, it will later have to be combined with uh, narrowband blue, as we discussed in our work. Uh, yeah, hopefully this answers the question. <laughs> um, we have one, uh, two about neural networks. If you considered other architectures like independent MLPs and the other one, is uh, the loss you used when training the network and you found specific loss that worked well? Okay, so uh, I don't think we considered four independent MLPs because uh, essentially all skin parameters are connected with each other. So I don't think uh, we can do separate estimation. Um, the reason for choosing uh, the cascaded architecture uh, partially was because we don't have a lot of training data. Uh, we currently train on the um, uh, synthesized uh, lookup tables, which we generate with our spectral skin model. And uh, partially for this constraint, uh, we don't use CNNs, for example. Um, regarding the loss, uh, I think my co-authors would uh, be able to answer this question better than me. So. For this question, I think it's better to uh, use a discussion. Uh, I'm deeply sorry. I think we are running out of time because we reached the end of the session. I hope you can stick around in the chat and answer all the other amazing questions we have there. Yes, because sure. there are a lot. <laughs> and otherwise, uh, for the sake of keeping everything within the time frame, I would now like to thank the presenters again for their contribution and their amazing work and hope to see everyone again in the next session. Bye.